Hey y'all, today we have Yunmi Park on the show. Now I say that we have a lot of exciting guests on the show, but uh, to me, this was one of the most interesting, one of the most intriguing, just because of my personal background of growing up in South Korea. And a lot of the stories that I would hear from my family members about North Koreans, what happened in North Korea, and just overall the, the, the amount of attention that's given around North Korea and how, how much is misunderstood about what's happening in the uh, only country that's yet to be open to the rest of the world. Uh, Yeon Mi is someone who was born in North Korea, and she, uh, along with her sister and her mother, uh, grew up in the Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un regime, where she ended up escaping North Korea at the age of 13. And she went to uh, China, where she was sold by a human trafficker. Um, from what she was saying, her mom was sold for $65 and she was sold for $200. And uh, obviously it's very disturbing content, um, but it's it was an important message that she provided in terms of the lifestyle and what really goes on around North Korea. It was really heartbreaking to be able to go through this story of how she ended up in China, eventually she went to Mongolia uh, and she landed in South Korea um, where now she is staying in Chicago. Now, this is a very short story without really going into the details of what it was like to escape North Korea and the details of some of the horrific things that she's seen, some of the things that has been done to her and her mom um, and, and the the, the message really that's been taken away. Um, Yunmi Park is now one of the most famous North Korean um, uh, defectors and human rights activists where her one of her talks has gotten over 80 million views uh, in just two days on YouTube and social media where she talked about her journey of escaping North Korea and how she's been able to adjust living the Western lifestyle. So I really am excited to bring you on here with you guys. And I would recommend you guys to check out her book, In Order to Live, A North Korean Girl's Journey to Freedom. All right, guys, enjoy my conversation with Yunmi. And uh, thank you guys for listening. Yanmi Park, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. <laughs> I forgot to mention this before we started, Ashley. Happy belated birthday. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it was uh, October 4th, uh, right? Yeah. Oh, thank you for remembering that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, how did you, well, actually, I'm curious to know, how would you normally mm -hmm. celebrate your birthday back in North Korea? <sighs> Well, I mean, it. I mean, birthday is something North Koreans do celebrate as well, but we don't have things like birthday cake or like that. So mm. if we are really maybe well off, maybe maximum, my parents or family would do is like making few like rice cake. You know, Korean like we eat duck, duck, right? Like I rice love cake. I love duck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's. The probably most fancy way to celebrate it, but obviously it's very different like tradition. And also, you know, in North Korea, we don't really have like cultural party, not gotcha. such a thing like that. I mean, because of this communist society, they do not want us to assemble and have events on our own without reporting. Really? So if we, oh, yeah. So if you are kids, you can like meet your school, I mean, school friends, but as an adult, I don't think there's like more than five people get can gather at the same time without unreported. 
No not way. Eight, maybe five or seven or something like that. So there, they definitely do limit people how many people can gather. So it's like the quarantine, corona lockdown, but it's yeah. for all of the country at all the time. All the time. So you don't even know what I mean. Like the difference would be. Mm-hmm. That's insane. So this must be. Uh, it's quite a change. Well, I guess it wasn't that much of a change for you to celebrate your birthday here with your family than to be, you know, to be back in North Korea, I imagine. Like the, yeah. you did never, you never were used to big parties or anything like that mm, in North Korea. No, no. Yeah. Never even heard of a thing called a surprise party in North Korea. <laughs> never heard of such a thing. So, because like, they, they, nobody proposes in North Korea. We don't have the culture of romanticism. Romanticism is something viewed upon as something shameful and corrupt, like capitalist symbol. Yeah. So they don't even have the vocabulary for romance. So how do they, there's just no word that's similar to romance. So like love, is there a word for love there? No, we only have the word that North Koreans are using is like a written form of the word when we only describe our feelings to the dictators, the Kim family. Which is, and what's we, the word for that? Yeah, that is like sarang, the same in Korean, but only in the written form. Um, verbally, we never say it though. So I, was, so I never like used the word of love in my mouth until I went to South Korea. And then my father oh. never told my mom he loved her or nobody did. So when you were talking to your mom and you would, let's say you had like one last word to say to her, Because you've been in these situations, obviously, where your life was in danger and you saw Mm -hmm. your mom's life in danger. What would the last words be that you could say if you had only one or two words to say to her? If you didn't say, I love you. Hmm. That's the thing. Like, uh, I think North, I don't think I can speak for behalf of 25 million people. Sure. But I think only this year after I had my own child, I realized the word of like meaning of love. But until then, it was something so taboo in North Korea. So I think if I were dying and back then, what would I tell my mom was like maybe, I don't even make you say thank you because saying thank mm. you is not even in our culture to oh, do it's it. Not, okay. Yeah, so. Okay. So not thank you, not love you. Yeah, uh, so they literally like care the and anything that humanity can do. Like, it is a, um, you know, I don't know. Honestly, I have to think about it. Yeah, but it is definitely different. Like, uh, I remember like when I was coming out of North Korea, and people were saying like, "Oh, what were the things that you're shocked by?" Like that, right? But when you come out from that kind of long time of oppression. You do not know how to fear. You're like numb. Mm. Later, it took me to be shocked and surprised. But in the beginning, it was like I didn't feel anything. Wow. Yeah. And the idea of surprise, I guess, was never a happy. You never mm-hmm. thought of happy things. It was always a bad surprise. Like someone, yeah. right? Yeah. Someone snuck up being, on you or. Right, right. Being arrested and tortured, like all of it. So. <sighs> Oh my God. Well, I want to really go into your story mm-hmm. of how you started your journey. Um, so you were you were born in Hisan. Is that the right Hesan. way to pronounce that? Mm-hmm. Hesan? Hesan. I should really mm-hmm. know how to pronounce this as a, <laughs> as a fellow Korean. You were born in Hesan and mm-hmm. you grew up um, with, with a father who was, who was, um, tr- he was working in the Jangmadong? Yeah, the black market of North Korea. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And Jiang Madong, mm-hmm. can you describe a little bit about what Jiang Madong is so people have some context? Yeah, so when I, when I say like black market, people often think it's like he was a drug dealer or weapon seller because black market is like connotation of negativity here. And in North Korea, they started as like socialist country. So everything has to be provided by the government. And il- the trading was illegal. Like just even selling a bottle of water is illegal. So, but the thing is, after Soviet Union collapsed, early 90s, uh, North Korea didn't have support from the Soviet Union, and they were dis- they couldn't provide the ration to the people anymore. And I was born in end of like 1993. So when I was born, 
I didn't even know what ration was because North Korea stopped all of it. But the thing is, they stopped, they still not adopting this like a uh, economy from other like free open societies. So they don't stop, they don't give you food, but they ask you not to engage in the trading business. Then mm-hmm. how do we survive, right? If we don't make money, but nobody gives us food. That's why over that, during that time in the 90s, the greatest the famine happened in human history. It's like in North Korea, more than 3 million people died. Not in Pyongyang and capital, but the people in the where I was in the northern part of the countryside who were the unprivileged people. What was the total population? How many people lived in North Korea uh, at that time? I think it's somewhere around like 20 million or something, that estimate. So... Yeah, more than 3 million people died. And that's when North Korea started escaping, usually in the 90s during the famine. And so when I was born, seeing the just dead bodies on the streets were like my normal day. I never in one second believed that like that was something unusual. Like when you're born looking at this world, you don't think it's surprising, right? So it was like that when I was born, like literally just every day you're seeing people are dead and dying from not eat, having food and therefore my father had to go in the black market like you know he would buy like a uh, dry fish or sugar or clocks from the border region and take it to the inner part and make a small margins out of it mm. and then later he was uh, buying nickel nickel like copper you know we go like stores buying gold rings here it's not sure. a crime right yeah. but in north korea it's a crime so that's why he got caught and sent to labor camp and sentenced to more than 10 years for 10 just years doing, yeah more than 10 after he was tortured for many years and then they were sentenced him afterwards so it was more than that so i mean he was doing something everybody we do here we buy go to grocery stores buying our groceries but that's illegal in north korea Oh my God. So what would you do if you were to see a dead body? You would just walk over it. You'd be playing, you know, with your friends outside. You see a dead body next to the river and do you report it? Is there like a police in North Korea that you can report this to? Uh, right. So we ne- I never heard like thing called a 911 in North Korea. There's no such thing like you call ambulance. There are no cars. <laughs> right. I mean, like, do, they, do they come in horses? <laughs> I know. Yeah, the we we the fastest transportation I experienced as a child was riding an ox cart. No ox cart. cart. Yeah, yeah. It's like very slow, slower than like mm. normal people walking. Like cow like pulls this thing called with two wheels. Oh wow! Yeah, so I mean, North Korea is living in something 15th, 16th century <laughs> that we imagine. But I mean, when kids are dying, you know, as a child, I mean, I did play, but most of the time, I also had to survive. Hmm. So I had to go to mountains and here's picking up plants, catching, you know, grasshoppers and dragonflies, whatever thing I could find in nature to survive and you know we don't have running water at home so whose job is it i mean mother is trying to find food and we go to river and bring the water so we can like clean our floor and wash our hands and cook things and also we don't have this like gas stove or running electricity what do we do we need to go to mountain to looking for woods or looking for some cord to make fire in north korea is a freezing cold and if you don't have a heating system, you can die from cold in the winter time. So staying to try to stay warm is another survivor. Oh my God. So you, you would cast dragonflies and you would eat it? It's for the purpose? Oh yeah. Yeah, of course. All of that is for eating. Oh my God. Because I did the exact same thing. I grew up in South Korea, of course, in, uh, yeah. in Busan and Buchan. Uh-huh. But it, for me, I just caught it and then I would I would release it. I mean, I'm just seeing how much of a contrast our life was uh-huh. at the same age. I'm just a year older than you. But uh-huh. to see that contrast, uh, yeah, that is that's quite shocking. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, even eating dragonflies or grasshoppers or fancy food, for sure. It was like hard to catch them because everybody was, everybody was catching them. Yeah, you know, and they have high frog, proteins. 
Right, like catching frog is such a like fancy day. If you catch a frog, it was like so happy. <laughs> that is yeah. insane. Um, so I want to talk a bit about the intricacies and the lifestyle within North Korea. Obviously, you grew up in the age of mm-hmm. Kim Jong Il. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kim, I, be, I believe Kim Il Sung died about like a year after you were born. Like six. The six seven months because I was born in October and he died in July of 1994. So like gotcha. yeah, in yeah almost like a year. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm curious to know what happened like as these maybe you don't remember as much, but from mm-hmm. Kim Il Sung who really founded North Korea, yeah, um, to the transition of Kim Jong Il to mm-hmm. now the Kim, transition of Kim Jong Un, right? Do you f- have you found that there's been a for lack of a better word, a, like a progression or at least some sort of a positive trend of North Korea as these leaders have shifted over power? No, there's not even one single thing that is getting better because uh, North Korea and society, at least when Kim Il-sung founded North Korea, I wouldn't say he was a true believer of socialism. He was a dictator. He, he was looking for power. He was seeking power. But still, he was trying to implement of like feeding people using public ration. But when it comes to Kim Jong Un and Kim Jong Un, they do not do that, and they give all these privileges to the royal class that supports the system. So, like, if you're a billionaire in North Korea, you don't pay taxes because it's socialist paradise. You don't have tax system. So are there billionaires to, in North oh, Korea, at, though? In, in North Korea, yeah, there, there are billionaires in Pyongyang. That's not and Kim Jong-un. A few other people other than Kim Jong-un. I mean, Kim Jong-un is like, he owns the entire country, so we don't even yeah. know how much he's worth. I think, yeah, maybe Forbes said he was like number 27 or 30 something most powerful people in, on earth of humanity. So he's that powerful. There are a few billionaires, but their power is coming from being loyal to Kim Jong Un. Mm. That's the thing; it's not independent from the government power. His royalty gives him money, and that money is coming from corruption and taking advantage of North Korean people. So this country only exists to serve the one family, Kim Jong Un. That's like. Not even one family, it's just Kim Jong one man. To yeah. in order to keep him happy and staying in power, twenty five millions of sharing their tears and suffering. Mm. So it's it's uh it's just a power maniac. It's getting worse now. A uh, defection from North Korea became even more impossible. They are right now so far like officially over two hundred North Korean defectors made it to America during the last 75 years. So not even one or two each year, that, that's the maximum. And how hard it is to escape from North Korea, it shows the numbers, but now Kim Jong-un is bringing all this AI, like the cameras from China, and putting in the border region. So he's making it even impossible than even before to escape from North Korea. Gosh. And people see that and they see his lavish lifestyle of how he's living mm-hmm. with his billionaire mm-hmm. friends. I mean, do they not form some sort of resentment and a form of disparity and difference of their lifestyle? People don't know. <laughs> like they my know. case. Yeah. Like I believe that Kim Jong Il was starving, like us. They making us sing songs like how our dear leader is starving and how he's working so tirelessly for us. And the reason we are suffering is because of the enemies like American bastards and Japanese imperialists. And, and, you know, it's like if you read 1984 by George Orwell, right, it talks about the enemies all the time and blaming the enemies. That we, Like North Korea, even this time, was saying we need these nukes because we need to protect ourselves from our enemies. Sure. Even there's no enemy, they keep creating enemy to brainwash us. Wow, yeah, and I remember you talking about how even not just whispering to your mom Mm -hmm. or to your sister, Mm -hmm. but just the thoughts that you had, you felt Mm -hmm. that Kim Jong-il could read your mind. Yeah, so 
that is the like one big error people get when they are trying to understand North Korean regime because they are thinking they are trying to understand this as some kind of system and some kind of government, but it is a religious court. They were they copied the Christian Bible. Like Kim Jong Kim Il Sung, the first Kim, his mom was a very devout Christian, and he was so smart to know that when you are a god. You don't need a logic to explain something to people, hmm. right? Like you cannot ask God, like, can you show me Jesus in front of my eyes? Can you show me your kingdom? And like, oh, you are as a human, you cannot understand God's word, like that. Like Kim Il Sung said, I'm a God. You know, my I love you so much, so I'm giving you my son Jesus Christ, and he dies for you, but his body, I mean, his spirit is with you all the time. He knows what you're thinking. He knows how much he hurt you have. Belief is having a faith, not about seeing the like uh, proof. Mm. Yeah. So exactly, they use that logic to make us to believe that kings are gods. He, we see that their body died, but his spirit is forever and ever living with us. And that's how why I was so convinced that he could read my thoughts and afraid to even think, not to even say what I say, but even thinking was a crime. And there was such a thing like thought crime, right? That exists. Wow, thought crime. Have you ever seen surveillances or or proof of, let's say, uh, being if you ever felt like you were being spied uh, beyond the religious aspect of it? But have you ever found cameras or have you ever found someone that may was perhaps arrested or killed because someone was spying, like the North Korean regime was spying on them and they found out something? Like, yeah. Yeah, so it is, uh, I mean, the cameras, I think, in Pyongyang, every hotel, so those, like, foreigners stay, they do have those things, but the countryside, we are too, too poor. We don't even have 24 hours electricity, cannot use the cameras to surveillance us. They are only doing it on the border, on the river, when people escape. But in general, daily life, it's like that you and me, and there's one more person, like three of us, mm -hmm. in the same room. How they assign is like, I watch you. Then you watch the other person, and that person is watching me. So even I'm being such a nice person, not reporting on you, that I know this guy is watching me, that will be part to know me. For that sake, like, I have to report on you. So I am spying on somebody, and I also being spied. Wow. So Everyone's creating, a spy. Yeah, so we are spied, and we are also spied on. So we are like this creating paranoia and distrust between people. That's how can regime maintain the control, like this absolute control. Like you cannot even like trust your own back. You literally can't even trust your own family. Like you, back in days, like people, Chinese people were saying during the Mao, the sons reporting on their fathers, right? Like, like that absolutely happened in North Korea. People were so brainwashed and they report on their family less these days, but it used to happen. And of course, like, they're always spies, and that's why the first thing my mom told me was not to even whisper because the birds and mice could hear me. Wow. And yeah, the, the paranoia is not to the point that someone was like, hear me out. I was even afraid that some kind of a bird could hear me. That is insane. And you're saying that it's a religion that they were teaching. So do they call it like the Kim religion? What What is the religion? It's called the Kim Il Sung Zui. Yeah, it's like a Zui. Kim Il Sung way. So and then our calendar in North Korea does not begin when Jesus Christ was born. It begins when Kim Il Sung was born. Oh so God. we are like Zute 1, Zute 2, you know. So, like, it is a religion. Kim Il Sung, when he was born, that our history as a North Korean people starts. So, so he was born, what, 1930s? Uh, mm, 40s? So, no, Kim Jong il was born in 1942, and his father was like 1912. So, 1912. Now, North, so now North Korea probably like Zuche 9, I mean, Zuche 109 or something, Zuche 109. So right, oh, okay. So Juche means like years. So it's like 109 it, years now. Yeah, yeah. In, in Korea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is so insane. Wow. And obviously, the people that the North Korea, the way they show the world what their country is like, is 
it's just Pyongyang, right? There's nothing yeah. else that they ever show in the media. And even as a tourist, I had a friend of mine who yeah. has family in North Korea. Her grandmother is in North mm-hmm. Korea. Mm-hmm. And she went with her mom from Canada to there. Mm-hmm. And what they would do is they would take away their passports mm-hmm. and their phones mm-hmm. from the moment they arrive uh, on their way to Pyongyang. So in the countryside, mm-hmm. they would not let them film anything. Yeah. And they actually, one of my friends tried to pull up her phone and they threatened mm-hmm. her that she'll never get back her passport. Mm-hmm. The moment they arrived to Pyongyang, all of a sudden, they were like overly encouraging them to take photos, videos. Yeah. Like, they have photographers ready for them to take like the yeah. best photos, the lighting. Yeah. I mean, uh, how do you as a citizen decide, get chosen to live in Pyongyang and what what do you need to do to get to Pyongyang? Because that seems like that's like the top place to live there. Yeah, so if you read the Hunger Games, it's like North Korea has a capital, which is Pyongyang, and they divide into the rest of like 13 districts. And the Pyongyang, the capital, nobody's suffering, they are so well off, but the country people on purpose being starved. They okay. are the the food is a weapon for the regime to negotiate with the people and control us. So the reason why Kim Jong doesn't feed us. North Korean people should not die not having food because I mean international community is like helping them. South Korea gave so much money during the Kim Dae-jun, the Sunshine policy period. And Kim Jong-un still gets a lot of money. Where does he spend that money? He builds nukes and builds more resorts for himself. And he doesn't give to us food because, like right now, if we are fed, we are going to thinking about the meaning of life. How can we, you know, the, the, we are going to pursue something higher. But mm. when you're on the verge of starvation and dying from food, all you can worry about right now is going to be next meal. Like there are tons of nights my parents would get up at 2 a.m. in the morning, just freaked out. What if I cannot find food today and my children are going to die? Like that's like how they are keeping North Korean so busy, not thinking of other things, just only survivor. So it's like the Maslow's heart give needs, I guess. Yeah. Without food, shelter, that's like the first thing you have to think about. And then afterwards yeah. it's going to be love which yeah. didn't exist in North Korea, but yeah. Right, right, right. The basic needs need to be met, but that is not met for the most North Koreans. And even though North Korea started as a socialist and communist country, they have this caste system between people. Mm. Like imagine that like here people in America talking about the slavery existed, blah, blah, blah. But like North Korea still has that system where they are making their people on their slaves. They are making huge like three big categories of different class of people. And then within that three groups, they divide into more than 50 different classes. 50. And most of the time, we don't even know ourselves exact which caste system we are belong to. Only the government is top secret. They know where, where our standing is. And then when you are born, like you are born because of the family. So your family, what your grandpa did, what your great grandpa did is affecting your status. And when you're marrying somebody, imagine like I was a poor girl in a low status and marrying someone in the top, that you would think my standing would go up with him, right? Mm. But no, no, that, that guy's status going down with me. It can only oh. go down. It can never go up. So you can't marry rich oh. like here in America. <laughs> you, you, there's no. no such thing as gold digging here. No, you can never marry up. That's the thing. Oh, so, no, <laughs> so no matter where you are, like if even the guy is coming the most prominent family, and you're like in the low status, you marry them. That guy is coming down with you. <laughs> oh my God! So how does one ever climb up the ranks of the society in North Korea and become someone that never. could live in Pyongyang and part of the Kim regime or whatever it might be? Never, never. never. That's why there's no outliers in North Korea. That's why there's no Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. No one, no one can be exceed and like reach their full potential. That is why North Korea is also poor. Or why you see these countries like with socialist like system, they are so poor. It's like they don't allow us to exceed. There's everything is determined for us before we are born. Like we don't. On ourselves, we are like owned by the state. So the 
the people who were living in the Pyongyang were the ones who were fighting with the Kim Il Sung like four generations ago mm. in the Manchuria. Then their children get to live in Pyongyang. If they don't screw up, their children get to live in Pyongyang afterwards. And they will get like all the benefits. But how can I change going back to four generations of all my family and making my ancestors do the right thing? It's impossible. Right. Like they don't give us a choice to fix anything. This is and the system is so I mean, screwing people in this way. Yeah. And the people that are already on top, their sons or daughters oh, yeah. would claim power. So it's a never ending cycle. Yeah. It's automatically their royalty. <laughs> yeah. It's like automatically, Donald Trump. Yeah, they, they, I mean, I mean, Donald Trump was like, I don't think he, if he didn't work hard, like, it's very hard to compare Donald Trump to North Korea because yeah, for like, sure. no matter his father was a billionaire, Trump still had to work and he still had to test and go to university, all of that. And I know people give like millions of dollars, like Jerry Kushner, like he went to Harvard, but like, it's very different in North Korea. Like, um, you don't literally do have to do nothing. When you're born, like who can go to college, which college determined. Mm. And the parents yes. didn't even doesn't need to do anything. So you are like your father was this this position, like you know which college you can go, which place you can live in, like everything is determined for you before you are born. And is that the way the education system is set up? The rich people will yeah. get educated. And what is the education system really like there? So, like Kim Jong Un, he goes to Switzerland to study. <laughs> uh-huh. If you're really top elite, they send you Switzerland, Britain, like China, Beijing University, really good scores. Like put on, I mean, and they go to like Moscow University. They send them all around the world to study. How can you and, do that, by the way? You, so they're working in North Korea, and uh, they're part of the Kim regime, the billionaires and, and their sons. Are they actually, they're able to go to Russia or like Switzerland and, and work? Yeah. yeah, because they, those people is not like not knowing how the world works. They know so well that if they escape to the South Korea or America, they're going to be like everybody else. You know, like you lose your royalty status. Like who can be royalty in this 21st century right now? Except some like countries in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia still has the kingdoms, but in North Korea, also the, this is like royalty last for the last of generation and generation. They have incentive to keep supporting Kim Jong Un and keep this going. And like, like do you, do you like so Kim Jong Un has this core support that he has, right? And these people are so much benefited by keeping Kim Jong Un who he is and keeping the system what it is, so they can keep enjoying their status and privileges like even in america like people get fired even by present when you are working in the high white house you get fired all the time especially during this time with trump right in order to can that that never can happen you might get ex- executed if you don't do the right thing but most of the time if you're being loyal to him Jong-un, you're gonna be fine and your children is gonna be fine too so they have privilege to, you know, go to Switzerland, Moscow, like UK. I mean, Kim Jong Tur, the Kim Jong Un's brother, went to like UK and going to those music concerts. The first Kim went to Disneyland in Japan and, you know, plays gambling in Macau. Like this family gets all the benefit they can get in this world. Do they share that he's part of the Kim Jong Un regime? Do you think people know, or does he go under like an alias fake identity? A lot of times they do go with alias fake IDs, but the children's like to Kim Jong-un himself when he was studying in Switzerland, they didn't say this is like dear little son. They said this is like some diplomats of North Korea, you know, consulate son. So they do go to alias and, uh, yeah, but the thing is like, oh, I'm saying the education is like when I was in the countryside being educated, I never even seen the map of the world. And I never even knew what Canada was. I'm so sorry, but like, I never knew what Africa was. I never knew what race thing was because in North Korea, we don't call ourselves Asians. Yeah. We call ourselves Kim Il-sung people, Kim Il-sung race. So we are Kim Il-sung race. We are not Asian. 
So in that, you know, there's no such a thing Asian in our mind. Like they call us Kim Il Sung people. We we like basis we are Kim Il Sung, and the calendar begins differently. Like we are different in a different planet. Yeah. So like, this is what the people in the most ignorant countryside get. But the people in Pyongyang, they do have access to really few tablets to the Google everything. But we don't even know the existence of internet. Right. Average people, I didn't even know what internet was. Yeah, the good thing about that is most Americans still don't know what Canada is. So even with <laughs> access to Google Maps and everything, so you're not yeah. alone there. Okay. Um, so with uh, with with Jiang Ma Dong, the the I guess the positive revolution of that is more information from the outside world mm -hmm. is now entering into North Korea. Yeah. For for like movies, I know Titanic was a big influence mm -hmm. on you. Talk to us a little mm -hmm. bit about, uh, you know, how these, inf when you were first introduced to this world of the outside. Yeah, so during the 90s, because of the collapse of a public ration system, the people had to find a way to survive, which is creating these black markets and bringing goods from China, you know, smuggling them. And from all the products they were smuggling, the DVDs and those like cassette, like back in old days, you know, I don't know what you know, but like this big VCR. thing. VCR. Yeah, it's like before CDs, like this thing. In order yeah. to finish like Titanic, you need three of them. Huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, I remember that. Yeah. Literally huge, you know. <laughs> now I'm thinking about USB stick, we don't even need a stick. But <laughs> back then, that's the period of North Korea were. So we were using those things that were coming in from China. And I mean, people literally get executed watching uh, foreign information. You know, this is like not a, we, we can never say, oh, let's go to movie theater, watch some movie. Literally, you risk your life while watching a movie. But North Korean people are that thirsty for the truth, like knowledge of the world. They do risk their lives to watching these things. And you know, right now in North Korea, if you read the Bible, you get executed. If you watch a porn, you're gonna get executed. And like a lot of movies, especially they do sanction on the movies like Hollywood and South Korean movies so much. They're not as punish you harsh if it's a movie like made in Bollywood or Russia. Or Why China. is that? Well, I, I thought South Korea was the ultimate enemy for North Korea. Is that not the case? That's why they, they punish you so severely if you watch anything from South Korea. Oh, you're saying South Korea uh, and Hollywood is more heavily yeah. offensible than Bollywood or, or another. China or Russia. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So gotcha. Hollywood and South Korea is the worst crime you can commit. And so, yeah, those movies we watch and, you know, like people get sent to prison camps and labor camps and sometimes execution. My case of time when I watched Titanic, it did like, it, I wouldn't even say like it changed my world, but it did give me a taste of freedom that like you actually can make a movie out of such a shameful story, like love story. Like I never seen in my life like a guy or like anyone die for love. <laughs> it's like every movie in, in order you watch is like everybody dying for the revolution and the leader and the you know cause of the keeping our country safe. But and we don't learn about Shakespeare in school. We don't know what who's like Romeo and Juliet is. Yeah. Those concepts doesn't exist in our minds. So seeing something like that, it changed like, you know, gave me some different like worldview. For sure. So what was your first thought when Kate Winslet is on the iceberg, the Titanic mm. is going down, Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio puts his hand up yeah, and he decides not to hold her hand, but let go. What was your thought process when you first saw the Titanic? So, I mean, it took a while to finish your movie because of lack of electricity. We cannot like just sit there like watching something two, something three hours. It took like two days to watch Titanic. No, it can take a month. Seriously, oh like my God. even the electricity comes, the power is so low, we cannot turn on the TV. And you also have to watch the officials who's coming. Somebody gotta go outside and make sure nobody's coming. We put the lowest volume you can do possibly. You know, <laughs> it's oh like a God. nine zero zero seven like emission. And so watching a movie is not an easy job in North Korea. 
it took a while for me. So I do remember like a, a lot of different scenes in each each occasion. And when I was finishing the movie, I wasn't like touched by the story or something. It was just pure like curiosity and fascination, like why somebody made a movie for this kind of shameful story. You know, it was, I didn't understand it. Like, did they get executed? Like, how this can possibly exist? Then it was as I was getting older, keep thinking about it. It was, you know, like I it did give me some kind of feeling. Maybe something might be out there. Like, like now in in here we are like keep wondering about the universe and different planets. Do aliens exist? Like, we don't know. Maybe they do. Like that. It was like exactly the same thing. Maybe the Western world is still not so bad. Maybe they are. Like, you don't know. Yeah. Keep searching. You know that kind of like tiny glimpse of you, like getting it. Yeah, I, I had a similar thing growing up in South Korea. Mm-hmm. I always had a vision of like what a white person yeah. would look like. Yeah. You know, and and I always thought like, oh, they have blonde hair, they're blue eyes, they're like seven feet tall. You know, they're <laughs> always the tall ones. You yeah. know, perfect like face structures. And then I saw one in Korea who was studying there. Uh-huh. And he was nothing like what I saw on TV. Uh, yeah. You know, he, he was, uh, you know, he was like, a, he was just like me, honestly, like yeah. he was such yeah. a normal person. Yeah. And I was like, man, like it, it was, it was such a revelation to see someone uh-huh. that was so different than me, but he was just uh-huh. like me. You yeah. know, he, he was eating the same food. He was laughing yeah. at the same stuff. He spoke Korean actually, which helped. Um uh-huh. It was insane, and I know that the humor in in North Korea is also something that I want to I want to touch on because mm-hmm. uh, obviously with such a difficult lifestyle that you guys lead, mm-hmm. uh, you wrote that the sense of humor in North Korea is is actually is quite vibrant. Like it's a uh, you guys that's how you guys are able to cope with all the difficulties in, in the lifestyle there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think one of the things you were telling me is that you guys changed the lyrics yeah. to the traditional lyrics yeah. that you guys have. But then when the soldiers come in, you guys yeah. change the lyrics again, yeah. right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I think that's the thing. We have to be very more creative how we coping with the reality. I think almost why Northern people are risking their life to watch a movie. That makes no sense, right? Such a little thing to risk your life for. But because our, our life is so hard, that is the only way to escape. So many. And when we watch foreign information, that's the only time we, when we can escape. And also reading those, like, you know, songs, like everything is so boring. Like everything is about how we have to be loyal to Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-un and Kim Il-sung then we have to, you know, just switch it up and making it more like human sure. and sing it. Yeah. I love it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I want to dig into the next chapter in your life after mm-hmm. North Korea. Obviously, mm-hmm. uh, what, what, what happened that made you really accelerate your, your need to go and escape to North Korea? Uh, escape out of North Korea, mm-hmm. sorry. It's simple hunger. I was starving and if I didn't escape, I would die from starvation. So nothing else. It wasn't like I was, I knew the world was like this. I was going to escape one day and become a human rights activist and going to America and none of that. <laughs> I didn't even know there was a way to go to even South Korea. Like, you know, there's no internet. How do we know? Like you, I heard a little bit of rumors in North Korea saying like, oh, I heard like the dogs in China eat rice. And it it sounded like such a like impossible thing. Like how can dogs eat rice and like humans we can't even eat rice? And then luckily by the time I was in the border town of North Korea, at night I was seeing this like electricity lights brighten up in China side. Mm. And I just thought maybe I go where the lights are, I might find something to eat. And I did not know anything about the world. It was just really, when you're on the verge of, you know, dying, you, like, if you end up, your apartment caught a fire, right? The, you're not gonna think about anything else, like try to survive, and if that means jumping off the, like, window, you will do it and see what happens. 
And that's what we did. It wasn't like anything. We had any grand plan about it. Mm. So what happened? You knew someone on the inside in North Korea that was able to help you. How did you reach out to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so initially my sister and I were trying to go together. She's like three years older than me. I was 13 and she was 16. But I was one day just couldn't, I was so sick and my parents took me to the hospital and in hospital, they don't even have like x-rays or none of that. It's like literally doctors, you know, rub your belly and see what, you know, what's going on. And then they realized, they thought I had some appendix were like bursting soon. So that afternoon, they just literally cut my belly without any painkiller. And that, I mean, it's all very normal in North Korea. We don't have anesthesia when we get surgeries most of the time. So, and what they found was not, uh, you know, appendix. They was uh, just malnutrition and infection. I was like only about like 60 pounds, maybe less than that, that time. So I couldn't go with my sister, right? She had to go. So she escaped a few days before me. As soon as I got out of the hospital, my sister left me a note saying, go to find this lady. She will help you to go to China. So the day after I came out of the hospital, I went with my mom to that lady and I had my mom's hand like we got to escape. So from that time, I was taking my mom's hands and we escaped China through that lady's connection. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know she was a human trafficker then. I didn't even ask. When you're so desperate, like th those things don't matter really. That's the only chance for you to survive. And it didn't really make any change what she was. And it didn't even occur to my mind. I had to ask her like, why are you helping me? Mm. You know, it was just like, you're so desperate. And she was a human trafficker that was North mm -hmm. Korean, and she had connections to people in China. China, that can yep. Help. Yep. So she knew the border guards, and she used the guys that she was using to bribe the border guard. Like, you cannot escape from North Korea like that. Like, literally 10 meters wide, there's guards with the machine guns, and if they have the shoot to kill order. Like, this time, South Korea. An official got killed by North Korean soldiers in the in the ocean, right? Yeah, they just yeah. like, shoot to kill him exactly like that. They don't even bother to ask you stop or none. They just like, kill you right there. So luckily, the lady who was selling us knew the border guards and bribed them, and then she sold us to Chinese people. So she sold you. What do you mean she sold mm -hmm. you? Well, I mean she sold us for. My mom was $65 in 2007, and she sold me for less than $300 because I was young and I was virgin, and virgin was very expensive in China. So she sold me to human traffickers in China. And that's how she made her money? Yep. <laughs> but she had the kids, she was starving. It wasn't... But the thing is, like, I cannot blame her. And then until I die, I will be thankful for her. If she didn't sold me, I mean, if she didn't sell me, I wouldn't be alive right now. I would have been dead, like, many, many, many years ago. But you had no idea who you were being sold to. Yeah, I didn't know. You had no know. idea what was going to happen. And she didn't even know. She didn't even tell me that she was selling me. So when we arrived in China, crossing the frozen river to China in 2007, the first thing that I see was my mom raped in front of me by a Chinese human trafficker. And I never had a sex education, so I didn't even know what it was. I didn't even know the word rape. You know, those vocabulary didn't exist in my mind. I just thought that is the most horrible thing I can ever see in my life. And then they were negotiating our price, you know, right in front of me. We are like dogs and puppies. Like people talking about the slavery markets in the past. Is that, is that like that they make you stand up in front of there, turning you around and see your conditions and they, you know, bargain your price and selling to the next human trafficker. And then they will keep selling us through this human trafficking chain and they were selling my mom and myself separately. So I was... Without my mom, my father, my sister at 13 by myself. Your dad is still in prison back then. She, he got out for the sick leave, which is okay. like he had to go back to prison. He was extremely sick. So he was at home 
and my sister was gone a few days before. I don't even know where to find her. My mom was sold separately than I am, and and that's like what happened after escaping from North Korea. My God. So you pack up all your stuff in North Korea. You know you're going to a better place. You don't know where no. you're going. You don't know <laughs> what's going to happen. <laughs> what time did you leave? And how do you get there? Is it a boat that you go on? It is so funny. You said like pack up your stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> I mean, I don't have a lot of stuff either. But, you know. No, we you're, don't you're, even know like what. The dragonflies. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, if we had a stuff to pack up, I wouldn't escape, right? <laughs> yeah. No, of course we didn't have yeah, yeah. anything to pack up. We left that morning in the morning to find the lady and she said she could tell us to go to China. And going to China means climbing up three different mountains and go to a place where there are less people could see us crossing the river. So we went to find a part of the river that was like less people walking by. I mean, walking on the road so could see down us across the river. And then that's when the the guy that she was using was helping us to cross the frozen river. It was frozen so we could walk on top of the river to China. And you at any point could have been shot and Oh, or like and, the and river. Murdered. It was like, it was uh, March 26th. Oh, March 30th. Oh my God, I'm, I'm losing the dates. It's in my book. So maybe March 30th of 2007, 2007 even though North Korea is that cold, by that time, most of the river was like unfrozen the meter. So that was like so scary, you know, I don't know how to swim and in like it was coming from back to the mountains, top of the mountains. So water like sweeps very fast. It's not like average water, like gentle. It's really sweeping you down. Mm. And if you take it to the under the water, that's how a lot of North Korean people die when they escape. Yeah, shooting is the number one problem because like they only, when they send you to China, they only bribe to do one guard. But the problem is like, this guy knows, but the other guy's 10 meters wide, the other guy's 10 meters are not all can see me and dogs are barking. Mm. And there's are so many dogs on the border, you know, it's very hard to not get caught. Oh my God, and it was just you and your mom and then one And then this guy were trying to set us, yeah, to Chinese broker. And what was going through your mind? Were you just... I mean, I was, you know, the will to survive is so, like, when you, like, we have this strength that we don't know on normal times. We don't know. Like, it only comes out when you are, like, in front of death. Like, you can even, like, mind move the mountains, that kind of strength that you never know you had. So I would just got out of the hospital. I was completely malnourished, and I was running so fast, <laughs> even before my mom. You know, in, when you're like dying, it's not like on in front of like the gunshot in front of you. It's so terror, like make you think a lot of things. You cannot really think. Only thing is like, oh, I cannot get shot. I cannot get shot. How can I run so fast? I don't get shot. Like that's all you think. It's not like about how much I love my mom, how much I love my father. None of that stuff. Just like in that mode, you just only think about your survivor. That's what human nature is like. The survivor instinct is like covers everything else. And from the day you escaped from North Korea to arriving in China, was that a few hours? It was, yeah. Day? When we were climbing up the like hills and mountains, it took a whole afternoon. But crossing that river only took like, I'm sure maybe an hour. Maybe I don't know exactly, but it wouldn't be that long. Yeah. Because the river is short, but we had to go a lot of other parts to go to get that point. Right, gotcha. So you were in China from 2007 to 2009. Yeah. And what what happened to so the people that you got sold to? What mm -hmm. were they like? What was your life <laughs> like after that? Where well, I was a sexual slave at 13. So that was the only Chinese regime, the Communist Party, catch us even though that is the they are committing crimes against humanity according to the united nations and geneva convention like because north korean defectors are not like normal refugees we are not running away from just economic pressure it's like we are political refugees 
the regime knows if we escape, they're gonna bring us and put us torture, then kill us, ex- execute us, or put us concentration camps. So China has a responsibility to protect us. Any country need to protect our political refugees. Like very different from other other types of refugees. But China, of course, completely ignores that the international law and do catch us and send us back to North Korea. So we, from there on, after escaping from North Korea, we would think everything is over, but no. So we have even more oppression from Chinese regime. And, you know, they American talking about the slave hunters, right? Back in old days, they were hunting slaves. That exists right now in China. Even today? Lit- oh, right now in this moment. If you go like Yanbyeon, the more the northern part, like northeast of China, they have this like line text you when you get there, like, oh, if you use your northern defector, call us, I'm going to give you money. They give you money if you if you hunt a defector. So we are hunting by North average Chinese people trying to catch us so they can make money from the government and the government is trying to catch us so and then traffickers raping us and that's the thing they say even if I kill you right now they know that we cannot go to police if we go to police of course our fate is dead so what's the point of getting killed by police than the human trafficker and this there right now about 300,000 North Korean defectors are hiding in China being raped every day in this in this, uh, they lock us up and rape us and they make brothels and make North Korean women becoming, uh, inject them and let the men to rape them and they make money. And they treat us like less than pigs. They call literally North Korean women pigs in China. And, and you know, there are so many organ traffickings in China. Yeah, it's like, uh, this is like 21st we are living in. And we cannot talk about it here right now because China is such a powerful country that everybody, every business want to go in and have a business with. And on purposely, world is ignoring this problem because people don't want to bother Chinese regime. And this is like the darkness that you know we are we are, we are seeing here. So you think because the UN and the US they know about these issues, but because of the trade wars and the economic power of China. They're just mm-hmm. letting this go. Yeah, I mean, you hear about the girls who were captured by ISIS getting Nobel Peace Prize, and Michelle Obama comes out talking about these girls captured the Boko Haram. Who do we know? Any major stream media talking about North Korean women's like current capturing in China? Nobody. Mm-hmm. And China is like the member of the UN General Assembly, the councils. They are the ones who's deciding who is like violating human rights with Russia on the table. So of course, like UN is not able to do anything. And the international community, like in America, like the companies, even like Google or all other companies, I mean, I don't think Google China had to withdraw, but a lot of all the you know, Western corporations do want to get a Chinese market portion because such a big market they have to gain. And, you know, the, if as long as they talk about this political oppression the Chinese Communist Party is imposing, they are not going to get that. The Chinese people are getting censored and we are getting censored. Even Hollywood cannot dare to make a movie now showing anything negative of the Chinese regime. So this is why on purpose this plight of North Korean people, women, has been hidden. And everybody knows it. But they just like they just like pretend they don't see it and hear it. Mm-hmm. And when when you arrived in China and your you and your mom and are being used as sex slaves, yeah, did you ever have doubts about staying in China and and did you ever think about returning to North Korea because of how horrific the lifestyle was in China, or was it still for you mm-hmm. better than the lifestyle you had in North Korea? So this is again, like, if you don't eat, you die. Like hunger means death in North Korea. It's not means hunger means I'm hungry. Like you're gonna die. So if I go to North Korea, even though regime is being so nice to me, not executing me and not torturing me, there's no way for me to find food. I will die. In China, if I was being raped constantly and still lucky enough not get caught by Chinese authority, I at least get fed. That means I'm living. 
I'm not dying. That is why you know, can women choose China, not because it's a better option. Like, at least in China, if you are lucky enough to not get caught, you can maintain your life. That is why after three years of China, my mother and myself and few other defectors, we were risking our life and crossing the Gobi Desert, walking to Mongolia to find freedom. So you escaped from your uh, human trafficker or the person mm-hmm. that bought you. Yeah. You found a way out. Yeah. And you made your way to Mongolia? Yeah, we crossed the Gobi Desert from China to Mongolia in 2009 after Chinese Beijing Olympic. And lucky enough, we survived a lot of after drama. I mean, this is why I wrote a book. It's such a long story. It but is, yeah. We're trying to tell the summary of it as best yeah. as we can. Yeah, yes. so that's that's what North Korean women do. If they are, get lucky like me, they do survive and go to South Korea or come to America. But most of them are not. Only special few chosen ones to survive for their long journey. Mm-hmm. Right. And you, so you eventually made it into South Korea, mm-hmm. thankfully. And mm-hmm. by law, you get an immediate residency. You get a passport yeah. in South Korea. Mm-hmm. How did you feel when you finally tasted, mm. uh, a, a, you know, a taste of freedom Yeah. when you first arrived to South Korea? Well, I mean, it's the thing. Is, isn't, isn't it so funny that if I can be complaining about, I shouldn't be complaining anything about after North Korea and China, right? But... Inside Korea, I'm so grateful they gave me that ID, so I wasn't haunted by the police, and I was having a place to call if someone was hurting me. But the daily life was a struggle because I arrived in South Korea for as a 17 years old in Korean age. American mm-hmm. is 15, but 17, so high school age, where everyone's taking Sunung, the college exam. And they were telling us how South Korea is so competitive, and I have no education whatsoever. <laughs> and also, I had to relearn South Korean all over again. It was, was it a tough. big difference of the language of North Korean, Korean, oh, yeah. and, and South? What are the main differences? Just like accent? No, it's like completely. concept, lacking of concept. So they tell me supermarket. How do I know what supermarket is? I mean, mm-hmm. North Korea no have a supermarket. And they tell me, do you want a cash or a card? It's like, what's card? So they tell you there's a debit card and credit card. What do you mean credit? How do you build your credit? And then debit card, the credit card, you get a card, ATM machine. I literally thought when I was using the ATM machine, I literally thought somebody was inside the machine giving me money outside. <laughs> like how that's how we are so not exposed to any modern technology. So learning about even drinking coffee, if you go to coffee shop, I don't know what Americano is. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what latte, never heard of the thing. I know what, if you're going to movie theater, you have to move these like, machines to order now in South Korea. And like, I don't know how to push those buttons. Of course, I don't even know internet. Mm-hmm. And like taking a subway is a struggle, taking a, you know, a bus is a struggle. And then also the thing was, as long as you have this accent, people ask you where you're from. And then if you say you are from North Korea, and of course there's discrimination, huge discrimination. So a lot of defectors lie. They are like some ethnic Chinese Korean, you know? Mm, Joseon-jok, Insta- yeah. yeah, they say like, oh, I'm just joseon I'm not North Korean. Mm. So this, this discrimination eventually pushed me to come to America that I stayed in South Korea for five years and I couldn't take it no longer. I just had to come here. And when you were there, did you not tell people that you were from North Korea? You, you did something similar? Initially, I did. I was lying to people like, because I was telling them in, in the beginning I was North Korean and it was no way I could hide because I was not speaking South Korean accent. And then they were like literally calling me up like, are you a spy? Like, why? <laughs> Who was calling you? South Korean. I mean, a lot of people thought, you know, like, no, no, North Koreans were spies. Yeah. And also, they were dehumanizing us. They hear about this cannibal- cannibalism in North Korea happening. America did the cannibalism. Every humanity had that. When you're desperate, those things happen. It's not like only happening in North Korea. And the can- cannibalism happening testifies how insane the situation is for North Korean people. But they were like, 
you know, they don't look us like normal humans because mm-hmm. of that. It's a completely dehumanized. And also, as a girl, I was like, oh, my God, is 15 years old. If I were telling people that I was bored and stolen and raped, and they are still huge stigma for sexual victims in South Korea. And who is normal saying men gonna marry me? And who is like saying mother in law gonna take me as a daughter daughter in law in South Korean society? Mm-hmm. So I had to lie that none of that happened to me and lying and keep saying I was South Korean, but I had to do my activism and they saw my speech and of course they all knew that I was North Korean afterwards and they all got shocked. And after that, I, I couldn't no longer be there. I had to just come here where things were more, you know, more diverse. I mean, America is like the country with the like immigrants and they don't judge that I don't speak perfect English. They don't judge that I don't know things, right? Yeah. But in South Korea, it's very homogeneous. Even though I speak same Korean, if I have an accent, they think something's wrong with me. Mm. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I totally get it. I, I love South Korea. I was born there. Mm-hmm. My family's mm-hmm. from there. But mm-hmm. I understand the culture there just because of the history between North Korea and South Korea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is, there is a very, it is a very homogeneous. And, okay. you know, it, you can, even foreigners that have lived there their entire lives, they, they still feel excluded from yeah. the country because it just, I don't know. I don't know what it is about the culture there. Uh, for everything yeah. that it's, mm-hmm. the benefits of it. Uh, and and how lovely it is. It, it's it's difficult to integrate your life there. So even as a Korean, for you, you didn't yeah. feel Korean. No, I had a South Korean citizenship, and I was one day going to PC room, like you know PC bank. PC bank, yeah. yeah. We were it's... so poor. We didn't get like internet at home. I didn't have the computer at home. So back then, we were using Cyword. <laughs> And as a teenager, girl, I was of course fascinated by this thing. And my mom giving me like a ton on like less than five dollars to go to PC room. It was a big trip for me. And I entered, and this like other she was telling me like, oh, we don't accept foreigners. They literally say we go in Suri Like a lot of shops in Korea say that. Like first too, you know, you tell like they don't want the foreigners to come in. And I was North Korean. I all my life thought South Korea was same Korea, my country. I went in and it's like, no, I'm I'm not a foreigner. I'm a North Korean. I have a South Korean citizenship. And it's like, no, you're a foreigner. You cannot use it. Based on your so, accent, they found out. Yeah. So even though I was having a South Korean citizenship, that does not mean I'm a South Korean because people do not <laughs> accept us as a South Korean. So, but the, the funny thing is like the most people get discriminated are the ones like North Koreans, the ethnic Korean of Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai people and Filipinos, the people coming from the poor countries. If you're like handsome, American who's white or like Canadian or French, you're fine. But the people like us coming from poor countries having it the hardest, like, yeah. Yeah, I'm really sorry that happened. No, it's okay. I mean, it will change, but yeah. at the moment it wasn't. So um, I was also another lucky one that who was able to find a new home after that. Now, with everything that you've gone through mm-hmm. and the mental and the and, and, and the physical mm-hmm torture for lack of a better word that you've gone through th- th- things like that where if you don't feel as included let's say in south korea mm-hmm. or someone giving you a nasty uh uh you know someone making fun of you let's say or whatever it might be mm-hmm. uh, i imagine that you I mean, does that affect you the same way you think as most people or does, do you feel do you feel a little bit more numb to it because of all the things that you've gone through in your life i mean that is the thing like humans are not we are social animals why did everyone say that why north korean people kill themselves in south korea like our suicide rate is three times higher than south korean suicide rate and south korea is apparently number one OECD countries that kills the most the suicide rate so it's number one in the world and then north korean defectors are three times higher the people who went through the hair and kill themselves in south korea the reason is the loneliness. Mm. When we escaped from North Korea, we left everything behind. We don't have anyone. Most of the factors are just like themselves came. They don't even have a sister, or mother, none by themselves. And when everyone, everyone around you rejects you, you are left alone. Even though like things were so hard in North Korea, 
we never felt that alone because we had the family members, right? And in South Korea, I think that was the hardest thing. Like when, like the Chuseok, like the Thanksgiving was South Korea, everybody's saying yeah. like Seoul, like New Year, going to see their families. North Korea, we don't even have a place to call. Not yeah. even mention going somewhere for holiday. I think that is the main difficulty that North Korean people like experience in South Korea is the loneliness. Yeah, and not I, I dealt with that. Anywhere. For sure. Mm-hmm. My, my West Sungmo, my aunt, um, actually committed suicide for, for that very reason. She had a, an amazing life and to have that life of uh, loneliness, it just, she, 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 no one expected it, you know? Um, so mm-hmm. I, I totally understand what you're talking about. And, and honestly, I, I commend you for being able to reinvent your entire life to come into the U S mm-hmm. and to be able to reeducate yourself. I mean, just mm-hmm. think about all the things that you've been through. What was your mentality <laughs> like? I mean, what was your, was there a flip? Like, was there a switch that flipped in you where you came into the U S and you realized it just, you have, you can literally do anything. I mean, was there mm. something that flipped in you to be able to accomplish everything that you've done? You've done a TED talk, you've written books and you're, you have a purpose now. You're, you can dedicate mm-hmm. your entire life of helping people, those that went through what you did. I think I do know the meaning of not taking tomorrow for granted because my father showed me that. You know, there will be so many people dying to have one more day on this earth. And I know that I could, I know how lucky I am. It was me, I fought harder than anyone else. I just got lucky. I fought for it, but I was still getting lucky. So many of people, the fellow were defective when we were escaping, they were drowned in the Mekong River and get eaten by crocodiles. And it's not like they didn't fight harder than I am, right? It was, it was pure luck. And I think because I know how life now works, it's uh, we we don't expect anything. Life is tough, and it's not equal. We all get different like things, but it's up to us fight for the better future. And I think that really helps me going. In. And also, though, luckily, I I have so many North Koreans who are so resilient mm-hmm. and continue to inspire me and not being, you know, resentful. It's so hard, easy to be resentful when you are living in a prosperity and blaming on other things, but taking the full responsibility. And I don't blame that I was born in North Korea. I don't blame that things happened to me, you know. I'm grateful that happened to me. So I could live like full life, literally, full extent of anyone can fear. So yeah. it is like definitely, I think, a mentality. A lot of survivors survive afterwards. They do therapy and they cannot recover. And if you start that self pity route, there's never end to it. And I I knew that. And then I told my sister, who I found seven years later, like she was trying to go that route. Like, no, you cannot do that. Like, you know, just. And I think that's what really helped my family and myself to thinking from different perspective and always taking the response in me than not blaming others. And did you see a therapist after everything that you've gone through? I mean, you, you, you mm-hmm. haven't. I, now I am sitting in the marriage counseling. <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> before that, it's no okay. personal therapy because uh, I didn't even know the word trauma. It's like when you are so in a living hell, like who talks about trauma? Like literally. Those concepts don't exist in the living hell, right? It's only in prosperity we can talk about trauma, recovery, all of that stuff. So, I mean, my people who are sitting, kids sitting public execution right now are going to never talk about trauma. And it's never going to affect them the way that we expect it to affect them. Mm-hmm. So I think I really try to keep that perspective where I'm coming from and not trying to be in this emerging culture of like, I think I'm not saying he's weak. I think way more compassionate. But if I try to go out of like trying to unpack everything, it's it, in this narrative. It's gonna be too much, and I didn't need the therapy. Yeah. Because like I just, I mean, what is the point of me surviving all of it? And now I'm thinking about bitter about the whole thing, and sad about what I went through. <laughs> Isn't it? Like, what is the point of why I survived? if I'm not gonna live a full happy life. So 
it's good to know like how trauma affects me. It's, I read about books on trauma and I try to understand it. But I also not to, you know, get living in the past. I try to move on and moving forwards to the future. Yeah, I mean, that's beautifully said. I mean, I, th- I see that just speaking to you now and how uh, serene you are and, and how you know happy you come across your videos. I've seen some of the videos <laughs> and, and the, the relationship you have with your amma mm-hmm. and uh, how close you guys are. Um, it's, it's, it's actually quite, uh, quite refreshing to hear that, uh, mm-hmm. that you're able to still lead such a happy and, and uh, mm-hmm. fulfilling life despite everything that you, you've gone through. So I, I really commend you for that, Yunmi. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, so I, I do want to end it off. I know you have something yeah. else that's happening. Um, mm-hmm. Curious to know if, as a last question, if you had mm-hmm. a, ten minutes mm-hmm. to yeah. thirty minutes with Kim Jong Un privately, one on one, knowing everything that is going on. I don't know if you heard, but the Guardian just came out with an article of him crying. Yep. Of the uh, leadership failure that he's gone through. Uh, yeah. That's breaking news, Ashley. Um, but if you had a 30 minute slot with them, what would you tell them? Um, the problem is that why I even refuse to sit down with Kim Jong Un is he knows how humans are supposed to be treated. He was going to school in Switzerland in the land of democracy and human rights, where the where full human rights and democracy flourishing, right? He saw how every individual treated with dignity. And he still does not open the concentration camps and still killed his half brother, executing his uncle and giving it to dogs to eat, inhumane way of killing anyone. And and even killing like Otto Wombier, who's an American student visiting North Korea and killing this time South Korean official. Yeah. The, the thing is like he is a master manipulator. That tear that he shed is like obviously not about suffering of North Korean people. If he does care about suffering of North Korean people, he wouldn't have that built the monster nukes this time again. He could spend that money, even just North Korea GDP, like more than 80% goes to building nukes. If people talk about, oh, America is the worst country because they, they spend only 22% of GDP on the nukes, I mean, the army. North Korea spent like over 80 something, 5% on nukes. And the rest of the money is not even going to the people, not building roads, none of that, going to him having a luxurious life. But if he spent just like 50% of what he's spending on the nukes, he could have been feeding his people and not suffering. So she has no right to cry about it. He caused it. He knows so well that he can change it in his hand. And if he does remove nukes, not even mention just feeding people, North Korea gets so many investments and gonna the international community trying to help them. South gave so much money and they're gonna give more. So it is just like so so how naive people are like when the when they were trying the sunshine policy you know if we just keep showing them sunshine and love and care they're gonna open up and change their mind no it's not you cannot because i get it the people here never seen the pure evil they have never seen the pure darkness they they don't get it you know you cannot try to solve a problem with, you know, monsters like a gangster or dictator through the same way. And that is why we feared that we are trying to keep trying to treat North Korea as some kind of normal leader and representation of North Korean people. And the reason why he cried this time is because he knows that people are aware about, about the outside world. And now he knows how to manipulate it. He's keep blaming the foreign power trying to invade North Korea, how he's the one only can protect North Koreans from the enemy's attack, and how we need the nukes to protect us, even though there's nobody trying to attack North Korea for sure. And that is never the case. And he's keep playing the 1984 George Orwell's book, and he knows how to manipulate people. Otherwise, how can they brainwash people to that extent? 
So it is also that time that, you know, the Western media is going to know or not giving a benefit of doubt. Like again, Kim Jong-un came into power in the beginning and said, oh, he's a Russian educator, he's young, he's going to make things better, but he didn't. And now this time he shed tears, so we're going to give him another benefit of doubt. Two years ago when he met up with Kim Trump, Americans are giving Kim Jong-un a benefit of doubt that he's going to change things. And how many years are we going to do that? Why there are so many prices paying being paid by North Korean people. Do you ever see a world where you, there's a unification of South Korea and North Korea in your lifetime? That is way too far in the future. And I really honest, as much as my dream, my grandma who is from Jolabukdo, Jolabukdo. Uh, in the South, mm-hmm. she her dream was seeing the reunification. And she told me in her grave, if the Korea reunifies, come to her. That's how so many North Koreans dream is more than actually South Koreans. South Koreans, a lot of young people don't want the reunification because of the cost. They don't, they don't want to bear the cost. But North Koreans, absolutely everyone does. But the thing is, I know that how hard it is going to be integrating to world. And the first thing would be to me is that opening up North Korea's economy, whatever Kim Jong-un wants, just free the people. If Kim Jong-un wants to rule the country like China did, opening up the country economy, but the politically, no, just maintain the Communist Party, do it. Just free the people. That's all I want. I'm not even asking to get the full like democracy like America has. None of that. Can you open up the economy at least so people can go and see their families and and have a like normal life? No one need to die from not having food in this 21st century while we're dying from obesity in here, right? Like, this is, like, not okay. This is not good. Like, this is really not okay for us to let this happen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We usually end it off in a positive note, but uh, I think in a, in a serious manner like this, uh, this is how it should end because it's not a end it's not a it's not an issue that's ended it's it's an ongoing mm-hmm. serious issue with the only country in the world that's yet to be free uh in, yeah. free in terms of you know open to the rest of the world um mm-hmm. yeah I'm, I'm really grateful that you came on yami thanks so much oh thank you so much for giving me this platform and share my story absolutely I, I recommend you guys Highly, highly recommend you guys check out her book in order to live a North Korean's journey to freedom. Where else can people find you online? Uh, now they can find me on YouTube. It's called mm-hmm. The Voice of North Korea by Yanmi Park. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. I love the videos. Very humorous no. also in, uh, <laughs> in, in the light of the darkness mm-hmm. that you guys are talking about. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Yanmi, thanks so much. Thank you.